Now, there's plenty of tier lists out there on the internet talking about which is the best Zelda game, what is the worst one, etc. But what I'm interested in today is to dive into a tier list of Zelda speedruns. That is right. Today, I'm going to look into all the Zelda speedruns out there and with my personal opinion, break down what I think is the best Zelda speedruns out there. I'm going to explain why I think so and which ones are, in my opinion, slightly less good. Click this game before I get into it. If you happen to speed on one of these games that I rank lower, don't take it personally. This is just my personal opinion. But with that being said, let's get right into it. Now, when it comes to the first game, the first thing we're going to look into is obviously the game that started the franchise up, and this is Zelda 1. Zelda 1 has a lot of cool speedrun tech, but it's also kind of a tame speedrun. So, there's a couple of things when it comes to Zelda 1 that is fascinating that you might not know on a first watch. So, First of all, when it comes to the actual glitches in the speedrun itself, you have something that you basically see them start using immediately into the speedrun, and that is this thing right here. So this is kind of a weird glitch where if you go down to basically like the last pixel where the screen ends, and then you turn to the left and then you go through the trans uh, transition, it ends up transitioning you on the wrong side of the screen. So you're transitioning on the left side when you're supposed to be on the right side. And that can be used for some very, very quick overall movement. And it's kind of interesting, kind of cool. It's also very fascinating when it comes to these speedruns because these speedruns in particular are also very strict when it comes to specifically what uh, enemies you kill because there is a set pattern of how all the drops function in the game of which drops will be uh, bombs, which ones will be rupees, etc. So they're very particular exactly in which enemies they kill uh, and when they kill them, etc. So there is some depth that you don't understand at a first watch that is interesting about Zelda 1. But I still think that it is a fairly basic speedrun and it's pretty much like a very clever casual playthrough, not too glitch heavy. It's kind of a straightforward process. So I think this is kind of a mid-tier speedrun in my personal opinion. So I would probably rank Zelda 1 somewhere along a B tier where it doesn't do anything too crazy, but it's not either too boring either. It's It has some interesting mechanics and tricks and optimizations, but not too bad. But before we get further into today's video, I would like to thank today's sponsor for making this video possible, which is Instant Gaming. Buying games from Instant Gaming could not be more simple, but it's also way cheaper than money of your other options. For example, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. I wanted to play this game recently and it was still $40 on Steam, but on Instant Gaming, it's listed for only about $12, which is a much better deal. And this applies to tons of games as well. And when you buy one, super simple. You just get the code, you slap it into whatever program or you know game console you wanna redeem it on, you redeem the code, bam, the game is yours. And by entering the giveaway in the description down below, you can win a game by your choice. So what are you waiting for? Do it. For the adventure of Link, this one is a tricky one. So when it comes to Zelda 2 in particular, the actual like default category in the leaderboard is not any percent. It's actually 100% because 100% of this game is only about an hour long. Now, there are definitely some very cool mechanics in general, but I'm not a huge fan of Zelda 2 at all. And on top of not being a huge fan of Zelda 2, I also think that it's a very straightforward just speedrun. You're kind of just running from place to place. There's not really any glitches or tricks to like really speed up the movement. You just hold right on the D-pad, left on the D-pad. You know, it's more just about memorizing a route. So overall, I think that the speedrun of Zelda 2 is a much more low tier speedrun. So I would probably rank this somewhere along D tier. It's not a, like a uh, speedrun, so I wouldn't put it in the low tier speedrun category, but I put it at D tier where it's just like an acceptable speedrun in my opinion. Now, A Link to the Past is an interesting one. A Link to the Past is, in my opinion, we're starting to get into the really fascinating speedruns, the, the ones where you have a lot of freedom. And what I mean by that is this is when the game started to open up more, and we also finally start to see a pattern of what we expect from a Zelda speedrun. The thing that Zelda speedruns are the most known for is their glitches. And A Link to the Past is the first game in the franchise that really takes this to the next level. Now, if you take a look over quickly at the leaderboard, you will see that the main default category is actually no major glitches, but there are tons of glitch categories. It has so many glitches that it has no major glitches, then restricted major glitches, meaning you can still do glitches, just you restrict some of them, and then you have major glitches. And then on top of that as well, you also have major glitches any percent, which is different from major glitches defeat Ganon, because you can actually beat the game in only a minute and a half by clipping out of bounds in the first cave, 
and then just going straight to the end of the game. But either way, I think that this is just a good combination of a speedrun in general. It has a ton of glitches, and it also has a lot of really interesting gameplay mechanics and optimizations. So I think this is an overall very good balanced speedrun that offers a lot of different playstyles depending on which one you prefer. So I would definitely rank A Link to the Past as probably an S tier speedrun. Now, Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time, I'm just putting in like S plus tier. This is a high tier speedrun in my opinion. This is a really good speedrun. And one of the things that I think is absolutely fantastic with Ocarina of Time is that obviously it has its glitchless categories, but when you think of Ocarina of Time, you think of glitches. And this is hands down one of the most broken speedruns of all time. It has the most iconic glitches of all time, like in the same level of like backwards long jumps to Super Mario 64 with its rung warps, with its infinite sword glitches, with its bomb hoverings, with all of the tricks. And the cool thing about Ocarina of Time 2 is that it is such an incredibly broken game that for most glitches and tricks, there are like two or three different glitches or setups that you can use for each individual one. Meaning that you're not stuck having to do an incredibly difficult setup for a trick. You have a bit of freedom when it comes to, you know, how you want to execute it. So I think that easily puts it as, uh, as S plus tier. Now we come to Majora's Mask. You might think that I would put Majora's Mask as an S plus tier as well, because you know it uses the same engine as Ocarina of Time, but there are two changes to Majora's Mask that slightly makes the ranting different. Number one is that it has the day and night system in terms of the three day cycle. Now, this adds in a lot of quest times, and there's also three major categories for this game. There is any percent, all masks and 100%. Now, the kind of quest system and night and day and night system doesn't really affect any percent too much. Uh, it does affect the mask category and also 100%, but it's not too big of a deal. But what I think is more important when it comes to Majora's Mask, unlike Ocarina of Time, is you can't abuse rung warps and those sort of glitches in the same way as you can with Ocarina of Time meaning that you are slightly more restrictive in how you can clip out of bounds and do movement. And it all comes down to being locked in on explosives. And unfortunately, like Ocarina of Time, explosives are quite annoying in Majora's Mask. Bomb Chews is the most used item in the entire speedrun, and Bomb Chews can only be purchased for a very expensive price in Clock Town in the speedrun. Meaning that if you fail a uh, hover, you have to spend minutes collecting more rupees, going back to clock down, buying more bomb chews. It's just a really annoying kind of obstacle in the way. And it also just sort of makes it way more punishing, unforgiving of a speed run. So overall, it changes the dynamic of having a huge priority of glitches to being more bomb hovering, bomb hovering, bomb hovering, a little bit more repetitive. So I'm actually gonna make a few people mad and put this as an A tier category. I think it's still a good speed run, but I do not think that it is a S tier or even S plus tier. Now, Wind Waker. Wind Waker for me is an amazing game. And I'm actually going to put Wind Waker as S tier, which might surprise a good amount of people, but I do not think that is an S plus tier. And that is because of some more repetitiveness when it comes to Wind Waker. Wind Waker has some of the most unique glitches in any of the Zelda games. It has zombie hovering, which the first time you see it, you're just fascinated by the hovering. It has chest storage, which allows you to like walk up walls and do all that sort of kind of thing. It's an amazing experience. I absolutely love it. And the storage glitch in general just has so many fun caveats. And it is one of my favorite experiences of all time. The reason I'm not putting it an S plus tier is more specifically because of two things. Manual Super Swim, which makes early game a little bit more reset heavy, but I don't think that really removes too much from it because it benefits outweigh the negatives. More of the reason I'm putting it in S tier is because of how Super Swimming is done in this version, which is in terms of getting camera lock, jumping in the water and spinning around, which just basically makes you have to watch 15, 20 seconds of a flashing screen. Uh, which can get very repetitive and quite annoying for a lot of viewers to watch and strains their eyes. So it's not as plus an experience because of how many times you have to perform that glitch. And it also just makes it a lot more unforgiving in terms of speedrunning and picking it up. So that makes it put me in the S tier category. Now, for the next one, you might assume that the next game that should come up is Twilight Princess, but I'm actually not going to put Twilight Princess in here. The next game we're going to get is actually... Four Swords Adventures. You might have forgotten about this. This was a GameCube game that was kind of like the first multiplayer Zelda game that they released, and it's still considered a main series Zelda game, which is why it's on this list. Four Swords Adventures is a speedrun that most of you probably have never seen, but it's honestly a ton of fun. 
Now, for people that haven't watched or played Four Swords Adventures, it's much better of a game when it comes to being a multiplayer game over a single player game. Because as a single player game, it's not as fun because it's kind of a hassle to maneuver all four characters at once. But as a speedrunner, it is incredible to see the movement used, actually maneuvering and quick swapping between these characters. And there's also some fairly cool uh, sort of out of bounds clips uh, in terms of like swapping back and forth in between the transitions. So there are a lot of cool glitches that you can use to clip through walls. Let me skip to one right here quickly. <clears throat> yeah, so for example, right here, he's gonna, he's gonna pause buffer and then he's going to switch to having a transition right as he goes through the loading screen. He clips up on the bridge. He's able to skip a bunch of the stage. There are some cool stuff like that. However, there's one thing that holds it back, and that is if you look at the speed run, there is actually only an any percent category because that's kind of all you can do with this game. There's no way to skip it because of how the overworld works. It's like a mission-based game, kind of like a Super Mario Brothers game. So because of that, it doesn't have a lot of different kind of options in terms of speed running. So due to the fact that it is quite restrictive in being able to not skip any like levels and having to be any percent only, I'm going to put this in the C tier category. C tier because it's a really cool one, but it's getting low down enough just because it's so restrictive. Now we're going to get into Twilight Princess. Twilight Princess is a very awesome game. I love it casually, but as a speedrun, this is also, in my opinion, an A tier speedrun and not an S tier. The reason I would rank it right here is quite simply because of a few reasons. Number one, it's quite a long speedrun. Like the shortest category you can speedrun here is three hours long. Second of all, it is one of the most punishing games in the entire franchise. It has a really bad learning curve. In my opinion, what makes a speedrun great is something that's easy to learn, but hard to master. Now, all Zelda games are not that way. A lot of them are hard to learn, but Twilight Princess is on another level. Twilight Princess, I spent the most amount of time on learning glitches. It is a very punishing speedrun. And overall as well, it is quite kind of repetitive by using like the same one or two glitches over and over again. Really good speedrun. I'm not gonna go into too much more detail. It gets an A tier for me. Next up, we have Skyward Sword. If you would have asked me a few years ago, I would have put this in the low tier speedrun. It would have been the first one in the low tier speedrun. However, in recent times, we have gotten something known as reverse bit magic. Reverse bit magic is a really interesting glitch that pretty much allows you to play on the title screen in the form of back in time. But what you can do is you can set specific values and flags in the title screen as you load into a save file and transfer these values onto your save file, allowing you to get to areas early, unlock stuff you shouldn't have early and stuff like that. However, it still has a lot of repetitiveness in terms of performing this glitch and a lot of back and forth going title screen. So I would personally put Skyward Sword as a B tier speedrun. Not amazing, not horrible. Now, next up, we have Breath of the Wild, my personal favorite sort of game in a casual perspective. In a speedrun, though, a little bit different. If you would have asked me just about one or two years ago, I actually would have put this in the S tier, but it recently went up my rank into S plus tier category for a few reasons. What made me really think that this is such a high tier speedrun is because of how much it's evolved and where the speedrun has come. Originally, it was a horrible speedrun. And it wasn't fun until we got movement glitches because that's what makes Breath of the Wild fun. It's an open world game. The faster you can maneuver, the, f the more fun it gets. We also got stuff like shield clips, a bunch of those kind of glitches that you probably have already heard of. What makes me think it's an S tier speed run now though is because I used to think that it was too boring because you just went through the Great Plateau over and over again. And then the rest of the game was just BIL, 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 over and over and over again. Until recently, when Wiggle Bombing was found. When Wiggle Bomb was found, you now have three main forms of movement. You still have BIL, and you still have Bullet Time Bounces, but now you also have Wiggle Bomb. But unlike Bullet Time Bounces, which is so limited in where you can implement it that it was kind of obsolete for most categories, and we just did BILs, you now have Wiggle Bombs, which actually replaces a lot of BILs. And due to that, it gets an S plus for me. Now, we're getting into a fun territory, which is actually the remakes. The remakes is something that I think is often overlooked, uh, except for one, I guess, which is Wind Waker for me. But we're just gonna start off with Ocarina of Time 3D. Ocarina of Time 3D is for me, 
going to get a A tier. I'm mostly because I'm comparing it against Ocarina of Time slightly here. Ocarina of Time 3D though is by no means a bad speedrun. It's up there with Twilight Princess and Majora's Mask, which are games I consider good speedruns. The reason I'm putting it up here is because this is a true remake, a little true remake it, where they made barely any changes except for in the speedrun perspective because they patched a couple of the glitches or they tried to because in the process of trying to patch some glitches, they also introduced a bunch of new glitches meaning that Ocarina of Time 3D is very different from its original speedrun of Ocarina of Time, which gives it a nice, unique, refreshing way to look at it. But I still think that Ocarina of Time is better than Ocarina of Time 3D, which is why I'm putting it in A tier. Now, for Majora's Mask 3D, this is going to shock a lot of people, but I'm actually putting this in the S tier cat. It's honestly in between S and S+. I'm having a hard time to decide this. You know what? I'm putting it in S tier. Yeah, I'm putting it in S tier. Now, that is above Majora's Mask, which might surprise a lot of people, but Majora's Mask 3D fixes a lot of my issues with Majora's Mask because Majora's Mask 3D has more entertaining gameplay in terms of movement because it introduced a lot of new movement uh, glitches, such as Goron Missile. Uh, it also allows you to do some kind of funky stuff during first cycle, which is much more entertaining than Majora's Mask is with its early game. But more importantly, Majora's Mask 3D also has rung warping in a actual accessible way, which makes it very different from its original counterpart. And in my opinion, actually makes it a better speedrun. You might think it's surprising that I rank it above Majora's Mask when you never hear anyone speedrun Majora's Mask 3D. And that's just the unfortunate truth of it being on the 3DS. Then we got Wind Waker HD. I'm putting this in an S plus category. Uh, some people might say it's biased. Some people might say it's not. Uh, the reason I'm putting this as an S plus game is because same reasons I mentioned at Wind Waker, except for the fact that it feels less repetitive due to item sliding, which takes away the kind of repetitiveness of super swimming, which makes it way faster, way less repetitive to watch, but also it implements a new mechanic into Zelda games that are only really seen in, in Breath of the Wild and Ocarina of Time, which is that it adds a moon perspective similar to a Mario game. Ocarina of Time with its Hessing implements small optimizations where movement can save you one or two seconds with a glitch, that gives you more speed, kind of like fast moving to Super Mario 64. Breath of the Wild, same thing with BILs, and Wind Waker, same thing with item sliding. And I think that's a really cool mechanic where you implement more glitches that introduces cool new movement systems. Twilight Princess HD. I'm gonna put this in A rank next to Twilight Princess. Uh, Twilight Princess and Twilight Princess HD, honestly, it's kind of just down to whichever version you prefer. Twilight Princess HD is an easier speedrun compared to Twilight Princess, uh, and it plays a bit more of the game, but it still has some cool glitches similarly to Twilight Princess. Uh, so both of them are kind of equal. And then the last remake on the list that I have here is Link's Awakening on the Switch. Link's Awakening on the Switch uh, is going for me to be on B tier speedrun. I think that this is a really fun speedrun. I love Link's Awakening on the Switch in terms of the speedrun. It has some really cool glitches, like hovering up when you're climbing a ladder with the blue cucko. It has tons of out-of-bounds glitches. It also has like this weird layer glitch where you can kind of just fly through the ground because it thinks you're in a different layer than you are. And also Hinox Run Warping, which is actually why I'm putting it in B tier and not A tier. Hinox Run Warping is this kind of crazy maneuver where you can get grabbed by a Hinox in a dungeon and it gets you in this glitched state, you build up a ton of velocity and then when he throws you, you can end up pretty much anywhere. Originally, when this was found, it was only used in Dungeon 8, but since then it has been implemented in a lot more dungeons. And unfortunately, in my opinion, this glitch is not that entertaining and it is very frustrating and non-beginner friendly. And I actually think that it's a glitch that favors speed over fun, which actually made me drop it a slot in the tier system from an A tier to a B tier. Now I got Oracle of Seasons and Ages. Now, this is where I think I'm going to start to upset a couple of people. Now, when it comes to like the DS games, I think that what really holds them back are their hardware. I think as a casual game, these games are amazing. But unfortunately, in my opinion, in terms of just a speedrun game, I think that they're quite stale and the glitches are not that interesting. And it's also for being a handheld, quite a long speedrun. The any percent runs are about an hour and a half. So I actually think that despite me loving this game as casuals, uh, they are going to get the same rank for me, which is going to just be a D tier. 
they're kind of the same as uh, the Adventure of Link for me. Link's Awakening DX is gonna get a C tier. I think the game is slightly better, but it's being overshadowed by its Switch version. Now, Minish Cap. Minish Cap has drastically changed over the last few years. Now, when it comes to things like Minish Cap, it used to be almost like a glitchless, minimal skipped speed run up until the very end of the run when you get an extremely OP item. But over time, it drastically changed to being a very broken run where now you can actually perform multiple interesting skips and glitches in multiple different areas of the game, which in my opinion made the speedrun so much better because it is no longer a play casually for three fourths of the game then have a last broken fourth of the game. But now you can perform crazy glitches to skip huge parts of the game uh, almost immediately and all the way through the run. So Minish Cap definitely gets a pretty high tier from me and it doesn't have the, uh, the kind of issues of the hardware like the Game Boy had. So I'm going to give this a B tier. Now, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. This hurts me to do, but they're gonna be the only ones I put in a low tier. I love these games. I think they are some of the most underrated Zelda games out there in terms of casual game. But in the name of a speed run, ugh, they only have like a few minor skips and it's like 98% casual playthrough with 2% skips and glitches and they are quite minimal. So they get the low tier because they are so close to a casual playthrough, unfortunately. But I think there is probably more to be found in these games. I think it's just that the lack of popularity makes them have a lot of undiscovered things going on. But either way. Last but not least, we got A Link Between Worlds. And I'm putting A Link Between Worlds as an A tier speedrun. A lot of people probably have not seen A Link Between Worlds because of the same reasons as the 3D ones. 3DS capture cards are a pain in the ass to use. But A Link Between Worlds has some amazing glitches. It has some really interesting storylines. And it, I mean, it's based upon A Link to the Past, which is one of the best 2D Zeldas of all time. So I think overall, it is an amazing speedrun, And I really think a lot more people should check it out. But either way, that is my tier list. S+, Plus, Awkward of Time, Breath of the Wild, Wind Waker HD. A lot thanks to their glitches and also thanks to their movement glitches. S tier, A Link to the Past, Wind Waker, Majora's Mask 3D. And then you can see the rest on the screen. It just goes on. I think overall, this is, in my opinion, what is the speedrun tier list. Now, if you were to ask me, what do you recommend a new person to pick up in terms of a speedrun? Uh, Breath of the Wild is fairly beginner friendly, and it's also kind of fun to explore because you can make a save file and retry it. Uh, if you want to try a 2D game, uh, no major glitches, A Link to the Past is going to be punishing in terms of difficulty. It's kind of like a Dark Souls game. It's much more difficult, but it's kind of an interesting one. But overall, a lot of these games here is amazing, and I really think that if any of these on S+, S, or A seems interesting and you love these games, you should have to check them out. And even, hey, even if you love Phantom Hourglass and you think the speedrun looks cool, then pick it up. Don't feel like my words should stop you from speedrunning that game. Enjoy it. If you think it looks like a fun speedrun, you should definitely play it. But either way... That's, uh, that's all I have to say about it. By the way, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video of breaking down, in my opinion, the tier list of speedruns. I have a lot of more videos coming out soon, so definitely be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. I love you all, Townsend. I'll see you guys in the next one. Later, everybody. Bye-bye.